Good morning, uh, dear partners, dear friends. It's really a big pleasure to be here. And as had been said, uh, it's a vision of what we called in early time TTT platform, technology transfer and training platform, is becoming really reality here. And as had been said too, uh, we need uh, change just by observing what happens on the earth. I will give you some examples. And uh, the real key to change is basing on three factors. The one is the abundant solar energy falling nearly even distributed. If I say nearly even, there's a factor of diminution between the most sunny parts of the world and the less of about three. Uh, we have 15,000 times more energy falling for the next four billion years on this planet compared to the whole energy consumption, I mean the whole, not just electricity, chemical energy, heating, cooling, everything we need. So abundance. And uh, the second thing is that the power lines of the sun, the photons, are arriving every place. Uh, to make it a little bit more uh, understandable, if you take one square meter here in Tamera, and you count the amount of photons falling on it during the year, and you correlate this energy in equivalent of oil, each square meter of Tamera receives round about 250 liters of oil per year. So you multiply this with uh, the 200 hectares, and then you ask yourself, we should become oil cells. <laughs> But uh, we are entoured by a fantastic creation. And the higher intelligence of the cosmos, or of God, or of Allah, or name it what you want, has created uh, a biosphere uh, which is so fantastic that you can, in every level, only see the wonder and admire it. And when you look to it, you see there are certain principles inbuilt. Those photons coming from the sun, hitting first a leaf, which was one of the largest, the biggest inventions uh, of the nature about two and a half billion years ago, when it started uh, to transform this radiant gift into the matter of life. Oxygen, into fruits, into wood, into biomass. But the leaf is not like a German company saying, okay, I sell you not my product for each liter of oxygen, costs so much and makes you more, it's giving free. And it's cooperating very freely with a network of surrounding um, nature in a very complex way. We hardly understand some parts of it. So a field of opportunities, which is described for many people as chaotic, because we have the tendency to say everything is chaotic, we can't describe with our mathematics. It's simply chaos is the higher form uh, of order, and we cannot just go in such an order with the tools of the ending, hopefully ending, age of industry. Because we got in with tools like mathematics, like technology, uh, like really trying to take out with greediness in our eyes um, punctually the values. It's completely different. Here is the cooperation it's in the art. When we speak, how should be uh, those little decentral autonomous or medium or large autonomous systems be organized? You simply look to nature. It's not only physical effects. I pretend that the photons are also wrapped in a love field. And the sense is that there is a love of the creation to all its beings. And it's really, I'm not going to continue with philosophy, but I think it's very important to know that the destructive factor came into human development history the moment someone said, hey, I can make bugs out of it. 
money. <laughs> so he's breaking the law. And we are uh, under a extreme strong influence of this money-driven, very cold um, system, which is self-destroying. Okay, having said this, uh, this is a seminar about sun parts. Sun parts, you will learn a lot, lot more uh, during the days. Is a thermodynamic, simple machine which is able to convert the solar heat or also the heat from other sources like uh, biogas, uh, which is a wonderful solar storage, um, into all forms of energy we need. It is uh, in electricity, in mecha mechanical energy, in cooling, even working as a heat pump, transforming lower levels to higher levels. But I am in this introduction speech uh, not speaking just about uh, the sun pulse, and this is also in the logics what I told you. The sun pulse is one element of a larger body. It's a heart. You will see it's beating like a heart, therefore we gave the name sun pulse, like a pulse. But it is embedded in technology. So our driving factor, when we as a group of uh, private uh, company researchers started in 1900, 70 uh, with solar research in Germany. So I'm very proud and I must say that my father at this point had, having been one of the top scientists uh, developing rockets and other things, robots. Huh? He turned completely because he started understanding that we should use this field of opportunities combined with our skills uh, in order to produce something sensible. And this he said in an interview, he said, if we will not be able uh, to beat the hunger and all these underprivileged uh, systems for the poor in the world, uh, we will go shameful into our graves. And that is, is true. So we started thinking, what can we do? And um, of course, we developed Stirling engine, we de developed optics, we developed the most important thing. If you are dealing with solar energy, we learned it's abundance, but it's discontinuous. Nighttime, no sunshine, and in Germany sometimes for one, two, three months, no sunshine. So we need storage. So storage is very important. So I already mentioned uh, the transformation of solar radiation into a storable stuff like biogas, but also wood and others, is an important factor in our game. But there are also other storages, I will tell you. Uh, simple storages, you will see in our showcase, just hot water and engines run out, out of it. If you are going into more sun-poor regions, you, you need storages which are capable uh, to store over months or even uh, in the extreme case seasonal from uh, summer to winter the heat then you must either have very very large storages I will speak about this or so called reversible thermochemical storage if I will touch this too but this is, this is just to give you an overview and then we said okay how do we position ourselves in our development? What is the guiding director? Normally, uh, you are in a research institute or research company, there is a ministry telling we have topic A and you are uh, going along this. Uh, we have chosen another way. Uh, we got to Africa. We got into villages to Africa namely in Mali and in Senegal and Burkina Faso, and we interviewed mainly women, because we know that the poor women, they have the hardest task, not only in Africa. And we asked them simply, what, is, what would you need in your life? Well, of course, this, uh, this is Sahel, so it is semi-arid, have a lot of problems to produce, under this too intense sun and with the big temperature changes between day and night, crop. So could you help us 
uh, to grow better crop under such hard conditions. Second thing, of course, uh, what they need, they have one to two hours mechanical work uh, by milling, by graining. Could you extract some mechanical energy? Third thing, cooking was the first thing. We are walking, they told us, between 30, 50 kilometers per day to collect huge, you see all the pictures, amounts of wood, last remaining woods in these regions, which is leading to a desertification uh, in the Sahel only, which is equivalent to a land piece like the federal state of Baden-Württemberg. And uh, walking 30 to 50 kilometers in the Sahel. So can you cook? Could we cook uh, day and night with the sun? Then water. Wells becoming deeper and deeper because we have this climate change and the water levels go down. So it's hard to mechanically pull it out. But you have something here. And then water is often infected. It's not uh, mainly because the water from the well is dirt, but because there is no toilet beside. Therefore, the toilets are so important. We have seen, uh, we have seen in Mali. I never forget it. A Swiss, uh, a Swiss aid organization built a wonderful uh, photovoltaic water pump, and they said we are specialists for the pump. They saw uh, that uh, the <laughs> shit was raining in the water. I said that's not our. Thing. So the women have a big problem because they have eight children in the average, and many of them are ill. Dying. So can you do something against this? So this was type of attempt. And we said, okay, for all these things, you could in principle have different solutions. For the pump, you have a pump here for electricity, you have a PV area maybe with photovoltaic, with, with electric batteries, we'll speak about this, and so on and so on. But we tried learning from the multifunctionality of nature. Again, the leaf is not just producing oxygen, it's giving shadow, it's a main driving factor for the climate, for evaporation of water, and so on, and producing apples and mangoes. So could we find a solution, a combined solar solution, in which we are embedding all the functions, hopefully most of the functions, that means production of food and energy in one envelope. And of course, the sun pulse will play a, a large role in this game. You will see here also industrial applications of solar energy. And let me say one word before. Uh, if we need a change, we need money. And uh, we have to be a realist. The world is still, of course, dominated by the market forces of rich countries. And there's nothing wrong to earn a lot of money with solar energy, because this will uh, bring all the ecologic aspects in the rich countries. But the people doing this, I mean us here, hmm, we have an ethical clause. We want to reinvest this money to foster and develop the decentralized solutions. So that's Therefore, you see differences. We're speaking about combining food production and energy. A conventional system like hydroponics or conventional agriculture, you have greenhouses. I'm not going to detail. You need a hell of energy to cool them during daytime, to heat them during nighttime, and for all the functions of pumping and so on and so on. Now, if we consider the solar vector as one which has to be seen selectively. I will explain this. Selectively means large part of this, uh, of this radiation is not useful for the plants. So we have some sort of filters inbuilt which is taking out in the greenhouse the part of the radiation spectrum which is not necessary for the plants and make energy out. And then we have better plant growing conditions. Then we have a combined system. We called it, we named it EPG. It is 
envelope uh, power greenhouse. If you have a normal greenhouse, it's quite evident it's becoming very hot. It's got so called greenhouse effect. Because today, for example, we have uh, one kilowatt about square meter radiation, and the plant needs in maximum 200 watt of radiation. If you look, I think we will see a little graph of the saturation of the photosynthesis in function of the illumination level. And you will see if you go over 200 watts per square meter, it's flat, no longer progress. And therefore, it's we schematically shown here, we are, one of our systems consists in lenses. You will see this in life. Um, and these lenses are concentrating the, oops, the direct radiation. You have always two parts in the radiation. So one is coming from the sun like a spot. It's nearly parallel light, which can be um, concentrated by a lens. And the other one is coming from all directions, the hemispherical diffuse radiation. And the nature that was uh, we liked very much when we looked near in this, we observed that the uh, average is around 200 watts of, uh, of diffuse radiation. Therefore, a lens is a, <laughs> you know, normally a lens is seen as an optical system concentrating light, but we observed that it is also a fantastic filter between direct and diffuse light, and the diffuse light is just doing what we need for plant growth. And then we have uh, the concentrated light energy in tubes, and uh, from there we go in our systems. Uh, this is um, in Sydney, uh, so a greenhouse uh, with all electricity consumption and energy consumption uh, you have over the year. And here we have shown the monthly solar input, which of course in winter, at the moment it's winter in Australia, nice and cool, <laughs> so, but uh, daytime very, nevertheless sunny and cold tonight. So we ask ourselves if our envelope system, uh, please re understand, a filter which extracts heat, and with the heat I can do everything I want, uh, heating, nighttime, and making electricity, would such a coverage lead to the solution that we have no longer to burn gas. This is the main factor of cost. And uh, you see, this line is very important. We always have positive result. So we are producing more energy than the greenhouse needs, which is represented here. Uh, and of course, the bulk uh, of energy uh, coming in the sunny months must be some way transferred uh, to the winter region with, which deals with storage. Okay, what we intend to do is written here, local energy, local food, community security. And the key technical concepts, of course I said it already, is that the photosynthesis reaches saturation at 200 volt per square meter. Uh, we can cut out completely the infrared spectrum of the sun. We will see a spectrum because this is only causing heating and that's sweating the plants are requiring more uh, water to cool. Diffuse light, we already spoke of it. And then what we didn't say up so far is the so-called PAR light. What is PAR light? PAR stands for photosynthetic active radiation. So it is a selective process. If we could ask a plant, or if you ask a gardener, let's say so, very pragmatically, we go to gardeners and we say we want to hang a filter in your room. They say you are foolish because we need, uh, we need every photon. Uh, it's so scarce. And so we show them the response spectrum. So a plant evidently needs nearly no green light. The reason why the leaves are green is that they are reflecting the green part of the spectrum in our eyes. Very interesting is that uh, in the green part of the spectrum is most of the energy. And they need a little bit blue and mostly yellow-red. So 
and this, uh, if you if you integrate over this path spectrum surface, you come to your 200 watts. And uh, you will see a little bit later, uh, of course, the fantasy and technological possibilities of humans allow now to play. For example, we can change the green light uh, by a fluorescent process into a yellow red light. And suddenly we have more power light for the plants than normally occurring. You will see pictures. And this alone, this effect, uh, I just had been uh, again in Israel with the people of Ben Gurion University in Blaustein Institute. They have shown that by shifting green light to the red yellow is about doubling the yield of most of the crops they have. It's a very interesting thing. It's not against nature. It's simply playing with the parameters. Yeah. Here, 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 what I mentioned, these are watts per square meter, and you see that at 200, we are already in the saturation. When we have no light, no life, and then growing. Now, uh, yes, what happens is really wonderful. So I, I always have the tendency, uh, if I want a little bit to understand or try to understand the system, I position myself in, uh, in the main component of a system. So I always dream of uh, being a photon coming with light speed from the sun. I also have to mention that if you put your hand out to the sun now, we will have about per second on your hand uh, in the order of magnitude 10, magnitude 22 photons per second. Huge number. And each one can do something. So if this photon hits a leaf, you must imagine, photon's very small, the leaf is huge. It's not like an airplane and a runway. It's like an airplane in a whole country. And it observes fantastic structures. I'm not going too deep in, but they are beautiful. Because uh, all the quantum physics we say we have invented, which is of course not true, we have re-observed uh, uh, beginning 20th century. Quantum physics changing different light colors in oscillation, changing it in electric energy, then changing the electric energy into chemical potential through membranes, not like we. We say electricity is all we need. It's only because we build our society around electricity with central stations. Hmm? So uh, nature is much more refined. Okay, so what happens is what we need is light we spoke about. Of course we need water. Of course we need CO2, which is in the atmosphere, as we know. And now we need to build organic uh, molecules, sugar molecules, hmm? so combinations of carbon and hydrogen. So the light has, for example, to split the H2O. Another wonder of the nature, because the photons coming through the atmosphere, the most energetic, have just half of the energy necessary to cut in two pieces H2O. Nevertheless, uh, the inbuilt mechanism much more refined than Microsoft and every invention on the Earth is doing it. And uh, also uh, splitting CO2. And then, uh, because it's a quantum system, it's well known uh, that you need 48 photons for one to build the base of the life is, is, is a simple sugar molecule. 48 photons. And now, I'm not going much more in physics after this, but it's, I think it's very interesting to see. Blue light has a higher frequency, therefore each photon in blue light has more energy. It's this relation, energy is H, Planck constant, multiplied with the frequency. And a red photon, lower frequency, has lower energy. But it's not the energy of the photon which counts, it's 48 photons. So it is a big difference if you go into the natural, more blue-oriented light, then uh, the efficiency, the theoretical efficiency of photosynthesis would one day 
very clever people like you, maybe next generation can reach, is 20% of efficiency with blue photons. But if you do it with red photons, 35.5. There you see, if we change the blue photon to red photons, by this is a wonderful mechanism built in it. I said uh, in the extreme case, if you have an envelope power greenhouse, and if you are situated as we are here at the Baltic Sea, at the northern borders of Germany, you, we have warm summers, nice, and cold winters, as you can see here. So here we have built uh, a three-story EPG system in which we are collecting uh, with the principles I told you, we are filtering the light, we have a tropical zone inside, we are storing the heat from the summer to the winter, and we wanted to show that we can grow, this is taken the same day, inside. So we are growing, <laughs> we, are grow, we are growing bananas and mangoes in winter, only with the sun we stored, of course, this is a research institute, and don't ask me how much it costed. But for us, it was very important <laughs> to show the principle that if you have this combination, and we are coming to the machine, of course, uh, in principle, bear this in mind. Also, the average temperature differences on the globe are not so extreme. You know, you have Africa where uh, you have maybe 25 average or 30. And of course, in the Arctic zones, it's going to minus 20. But uh, we have just 50 degrees Kelvin difference. And uh, uh, one envelope creating a microclimate in a given stage and uh, taking out the light and managing it in an intelligent way allows, in principle, the other model is you go in the desert. And you create in the desert where you can grow nothing, uh, same things, sort of things. Therefore, our heart is in Tamera. <laughs> so we see some pictures from Tamera, and here we see well, uh, some pictures from the United States where we have a test center. In Tamera, uh, you will see this during your visit. We have built greenhouse, and Bori Kovac has really brought in wonderful medical plants and interesting plants because it's a difference if you want to create value. If you are producing tomatoes and being in a competition for fractions of cents, uh, or if you are uh, producing something very uh, precious. Hmm? So we could show that it is fe feasible to, uh, uh, because the climate is controlled inside, not too hot, not too cold, and the right light a very precious plants. That's, by the way, one of the points we just discussed in Israel with Ellen Soloway from Aravat Institute. She is a botanic researcher, and since 40 years, she has collected from all over the deserts in the world medical plants. And those medical plants are very sensible because they cannot be grown just in the full sun. They will die. So they need the selective shadowing. So the idea is to transform such a greenhouse into a pharmacy, the central pharmacy for an autonomous settlement. So adding uh, to the food and the energy, also the health. Because if you look to the world around us, those are the hooks, the big centralized companies catch us. Most people think we are depending in our health only from Novartis and I don't know what. And we are depending from Siemens, of course, uh, for electricity and other energy, and for food, of course, Syngenta, and I don't know what. We show, we, we show here one element. So we extract the heat of these lenses at a temperature uh, in a, a hot oil storage. Uh, we said we are choosing vegetable oil because in Africa and in most of the southern countries oil is available plant oil and you can heat it up to a temperature of 200 degrees and then um, with a little pump you pump it through double walled pots 
and you have wonderful heat exchange day and night and you can cook uh, day and night and you will see an example of this coming here. Um, okay, here you see a, here you see now an engine. It's one of the first sun pulses, low temperature Stirling engine, which is sitting beside a lake and is producing two things, light at the same time and water pumping out of solar heat. This looks like a nuclear station. <laughs> now this is a principle we started as our former test field we had in uh, the Black Forest and we decided to t transfer this test field mostly here because we believe that in a living community it's so much better to make research because this is not, uh, as had been said by Janoschen, it is not just doing one specialized thing, it is developed for the use and the well-being of the people. And it is wonderful to see how from very different cultures many elements can come in. So it's a network growing of ideas. We are not going to tell an African woman how, how she should cook. She will tell us, uh, you should transform your cooker in the way that we, uh, we are not changing our habits. One of the problematics in greenhouses, associated to greenhouses, is of course the plants are evaporating water vapor. This is the temperature stabilizing factor. Because if you look, uh, one other parameter for plant growing is that the leaf temperature should not exceed 30 degrees. If it's exceeding, efficiency of photosynthesis goes nearly to zero. Therefore, it's evaporating water. And this water, uh, you have to open lids, and it's going to the atmosphere, and it's lost. So we said, OK, what we need to do is to build a chimney in which this water vapor coming from the plants is, so to say, concentrated mm, in a geometrical way. And then we put in a condenser, you know all, if you have undergo dew point, you can calculate this. Uh, from a given temperature, the water condenses and is one back. So this is one of the principles we are working. How we close in uh, the greenhouse, a loop of water. It's very important. If you, if you go, I, I, I go to tomatoes now again. If you are growing in the free land here in Portugal, one kilogram of tomatoes, you know it's nearly water only. You could say it's nearly one kilogram of water in build. This one kilogram of water is certainly needed. If not, you wouldn't have all the molecules filled with water mainly. But then you look how much water did I spend. <laughs> and you see, you had about 1,000 liters of water necessary. And this is not for the capillary transportation of the uh, feedstock of plants. This is because they need so much cooling, because they get a full kilowatt of heat and the infrared. So again, by having such a system we can reduce. We still maintain in southern Germany a uh, little test field. We got uh, tentatively, we combined it with a, with a garden center of a very sceptical gardener. There's the one also who said, you are, maybe your theory uh, sounds nice, but we are practitioners, we'll never work. Mm -hmm. And now they are fans. <laughs> we really. Uh, created under this filter roof. Beautiful plants. These are also tropical plants we produce, which wouldn't grow in Germany. And of course, we also got into larger operations like Rina for tomatoes and so in southern Italy. Here we conducted the following experiment uh, in the northern countries. Uh, as I already said, for Australia, uh, the highest cost associated for a greenhouse is the heating in winter time. No? So in this case here, uh, we take out the 80% surplus of the radiation and we store it via heat exchanger 
under the earth, so that a large spherical uh, piece of earth heats up in summer. And the question was, could we, in the reverse way, with the heat exchangers and pumping from the warmer earth uh, to a soil heating system in the greenhouse, could we hopefully uh, avoid to burn fuel? And it was a wonderful result. We have found that if we have a, a surface A, can be a hectare, can be 100 square meters or whatever, of a greenhouse, we are capable with this system to produce for a surface of 2A, for two greenhouses, over four months is, uh, without uh, burning one drop of oil uh, uh, to, to heat the greenhouse. It's an important thing. And you will understand that, of course, uh, the big markets in, uh, in Northern Europe, uh, they want to have such systems. And that, again, is for us an approach to earn a lot of money, very hopefully, because what this center needs we call it now free lab, which is very important, because the ideas should flow freely and with fantasy. But without a little bit of money, uh, even we are not capable to do something. So we want to earn it with the system. The picture inside in winter, when we are pumping uh, the heat, uh, which is contained in the earth bag, and it's wonderfully growing. We call it liquid filter optic. You evidently see a frame, and then you see two special films, which are fluor polymer films, which last eternally. They are considered now from architects as being some sort of super glass. It's flexible, it's UV transparent, it's chemically inert, so safe, for example, containing water. And uh, between is water. I must explain to you, we don't have the spectrum here. If you see the solar spectrum like this, here's the visible part, and then you have the infrared part. Uh, one thing which is well known by physicists and experimenters, if they want to illuminate uh, a certain probe and they, don't, uh, and they want to get rid of the infrared, wonderful filter is water. Because water, is transparent to the visible light, evidently. If you have clear water, you see very clear through. If you would have infrared sensors, you would see water is black. It's absorbing. Oh, it's absorbing the infrared radiation. And since the infrared radiation within the solar spectrum, uh, or I should say that the photosynthesis ends at 740 nanometer wavelengths, Longer wavelengths are not useful. By the way, nearly the same as our eyes. So between 740 nanometers and 3,000 nanometers, which is the end of the spectrum, we have a little bit more than 50% of all the energy. So you understand, it's a wonderful thing to build a transparent liquid filter collector to put it over your plants, and you will have Immediately, all the infrared will be cut out, and the visible light comes in for the plants. And this pumped warm water will then be uh, going in a storage. And in nighttime, you are repumping it in these collectors, which are sitting on top of the greenhouse, and they are radiators. So it's a much more elegant way to heat by low temperature radiation plants than to have punctual tubes in which you have steam or heating it with gas and oil. And uh, you know, I was asked here, uh, what is the economy of such a system? And I think it's an important factor. If you, for this greenhouse, in, uh, we are uh, planning hmm, together. Uh, we saw very pragmatically if you go into Australia in this specific situation in uh, New South Wales, very cold again, uh, winter but sunny daytime. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the cost of gas for the greenhouse owner must be amortized. First, can we, and we have 
answered it. We can get all the heat out of the sun and bring it in night time when you have to heat. Secondly, how much can it cost? So this is one rule of industry. If you have uh, amortization time of the investment of longer than five years, industry is not interested. They want always fast cycles. So we, we saw that uh, with this technology, uh, I must be a little bit careful, it is still in a lab stage, but Daniel uh, is working also with a Freiburg-based company who will start to produce for us in Syria this system. Technologically, it has to do with, uh, with uh, plastic, special plastic welding. No? So uh, we are uh, optimistic to undergo the five years. We will be in the range of three years of amortization. And if you have something like this, huge, huge markets open. Huh? And then must be complete other structure. Then you need salesmen, other company, and so on. That's fine. Uh, but we want to have the free lab, so we need two structures. Huh? And we want to earn license fees uh, from the commercialization uh, structure. Now uh, comes the point. Uh, it shows you a typical way of a development. I explained to you that uh, a Fresnel lens, an optic, which is splitting direct light from diffuse light, is acting as a good filter. And you will see it's a rather complicated system because an optical system must follow the sun. Uh, the focal lengths are changing in, with the incident angle. So we have a mechanism. It works. But then, uh, you say this is a principle. Could we realize this principle in another way? And we found a wonderful way. You have seen vacuum tubes, and there's a tubes uh, evacuated with a solar collector inside heating water. They come from China. They cost two dollars per tube. There's one, also one thing I want to put your attention on. German company, very well known, um, is buying these tubes for the equivalent per square meter of 20 euros and is selling it for 500 euros. <laughs> and uh, that means that they are not really believing in the future of solar energy, but they believe in the deep pockets of rich people and they do it like this. So what I want to emphasize here is knowing this. A group who has more vision to the future, has also the responsibility to make out of this, let's say, a product for 100 euros per square meter. And that's what we are doing. So what are we doing? We simply thought that the lamellas inside of such a tube, which normally it's black, no light comes through, because the lamellas show to the sun, logic. But we made them turnable. So if you put them vertical to the sun, all the light comes through. If you put it at an other angle, you control the light flux constantly. So what we have done, we have developed with our industrial partner, which is a high-tech metal company, the little driving mechanism. And here, our friend Klaus. Where is Klaus? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Will produce the systems um, buying the tubes in Australia and we'll produce what we will see here now. Of course, in, in natural they are turning with the speed of the sun. Eh? Closing, opening inside and we will see the effect of illumination on the plants under it. This is, by the way, the first step to a bionic system. Because when I said that a plant needs 20% this is a typical uh, uh, abbreviation of the real complex nature of the beast. This is the average. But sometimes plants, depending in the morning or evening or of their age, they need more and less light. So it's quite logic that a plant sensor translates what the plant wants. And such sensors are existing. And so the plant, as precious living being, is controlling 
the opening of the greenhouse cloud. So it's self-optimized of effect. You see an EPG installation in Indiana, in uh, North America, and you see here a lake, and swimming on the lake, such, such a cylindrical uh, floating solar collector storage. To make it short, we have developed a in lab, and we have to bring it to Syria, uh, a technology where we can store much, much cheaper uh, seasonal the heat from summer to winter, much cheaper. And Australia, we have seen that all the big commercial greenhouse farms uh, automatically they create lakes besides because this is a rainwater which is adapted. So we can use this. It's a wonderful thing, and when we come to to our engine, I just say at this point, we can bring the temperature in these hot lakes uh, to a niveau that our engines, which will come sometimes, are running like a base power station, day and night. And we have in Australia a plan to do this at the Woodford Festival in one of the next steps. Uh, to provide, the, they have a festival, uh, the largest fog festival of the southern hemisphere, which takes place only once a year at the moment. So the whole year you have energy falling on this large surface, it's unused, and then they need suddenly two or three, uh, or I think even five megawatt peak. So how could we store this and deliver it uh, when it is used? Now we see a sun pulse stirring engine working. It is, it's a pot, round, filled with air, and uh, the heat of the storage, or the heat coming directly from a solar collector, is uh, uh, flowing through an internal heat exchanger, so that the air in the pot is heated and expanding and starting to work. At the same time, we need a cold side heat exchanger to retract the air, and so in bringing from hot to cold the air, we have the rhythm of this engine. Let's see, this engine here is uh, working as a water pump. So we, in this case, we start it on a flywheel, and now it starts oscillating. You see, the oscillation is uh, like if you are in love and your heart beats. But it's still a pulse. Uh, and uh, what we had, uh, what we developed is besides this engine, which is really efficient and long life engine, and easy, that's the most important, to produce also locally. Uh, that's our main target, to interest people uh, saying, okay, could we be the producers of such engines? Because we believe that if we have autonomous settlements and interacting in the whole world, we should also create jobs. And for the water pumping, it's specifically interesting for us because India has recognized they want to replace over the next five years 10 million diesel-driven water pumps. And they have to do because about 45% of the energy of India is going in water pump. Wow. Unbelievable, it's a huge. And uh, so we said, if we have a mechanically acting machine with a flywheel, we don't want to have transform this to electricity. We want going directly with hydraulic pulsing pressurized water uh, to an underground uh, hydraulic water pump. Uh, first, it has a higher efficiency. It is not rotting like the electric pumps. You have to uh, change them every some years for corrosion reasons. And here you see, so we have a little plunger piston. He is producing pre pressure fluctuations in a small water pipe, and that is what happens. Then we are pumping up on a riser, riser pipe with really good efficiency the water. And of course, uh, here, this engine can be used for pumping, but if you put a generator on it, it is an electric generator. And if you run it inversively, as we will show you, it's a perfect cooling machine, ice-producing machine. And we have a, um, 
we are in the stage, you will see this also during, uh, we are going over the test field. At the beginning we built them very large, now we are already smaller, and the next ones will be about a factor of eight times smaller in volume, doing the same things. So we had to learn all this heat exchange interactions, regenerators, and so on. It's not... This, this cannot be done uh, simply by simulation. There you see you need good workshops, good people experimenting. The idea was mainly to say, because we are at low temperature levels, we can run day and night. And this makes a big difference to photovoltaic. In photovoltaic you need battery systems, and if you look to the costs of uh, batteries, there is of course wonderful development, uh, lithium ion, it is wonderful in one sense, but they will become even more expensive. And uh, is you say the life cycle is not very long of batteries. You have hazardous materials. If you, you have seen in Africa, uh, for example, a typical thing, uh, corn meal running out of a solar panel and a battery storage. Because they need uh, for two hours about one kilowatt of power, two kilowatt hours. They could have a large photovoltaic panel, but that was too expensive, so you buy a small one and a battery, and it worked two years wonderful. So the ladies were happy, huh? no longer. Uh, and wonderful quality, but after two years, the batteries were out, and nobody came giving the money for the next battery. So they had to restart this. Huh? So if you have a, the thermal um, storage, there's no problem. There's nothing complicated and no poison, which is uh, then laying in dumps around your village. Such. This was the main reason we said we have to develop. So here we have we we built this a tube into our Fresnel lens, and we conducted through this transparent tube a fluid in which we have the fluorescent dyes. And these fluorescent dyes are such a way that they absorb the green light. And then they take the energy of the green light and lift electrons in their molecules to a higher level. And when they fall back, they emit this light, the red-yellow light. So you, you can create, in a, this was still a lab complicate way, now making a little step uh, to this liquid filter, you understand that of course we mix in the liquid filter in our, our phase changing materials, and we have both effects together. So this is development step. Uh, I was so fascinated uh, coming in contact with UAS Blue, mm -hmm. That means with on Andrew and with Hogan Gleason, and they have developed parallel to our works uh, fantastic aquaponic systems. And uh, just to make one word, when we started uh, looking how much uh, or studying what is the average usage needed of land to feed one person, it's a simple question. So the average is still. 4,000 square meter per person and 5,000 liters of water per day per person. That's the average. And I have shown you, the, so there, the overall efficiencies from the light to the product are fractions, very small fractions of a person. And we have shown that uh, it can be much higher. And so now, uh, Blue's U.S. have developed systems which show that uh, you can have the energy to produce combined fish vegetable meals for one person on 20 square meters, 4,000 to 20, but needs a lot of energy from the grid. So we said, okay, if we superpose our optical system over this system, would we be able to produce the energy required for this food producing system? Or would it even be more? So I cannot give you exact data.
but it turns out that about we have about three times more energy than is required for the internal uh, loop. That means, in principle, uh, for very harsh climates, I'm not speaking here against the permaculture, so, but you come into conditions, especially also if we speak about large towns, uh, where you don't have a lot of surface. And there, the idea is uh, that we build around the towns such EPGs, bringing on very short way the food, by the way, high quality food, huh? there's no pesticides, fungicides involved, in the town, but also the energy, because two thirds is energy, one third is food. So that's a vision. In any case, knowing, I think this is a driving factor, how many people are still dying, starvation, every year in the world, most don't really realize. We have a real holocaust each year, it's six million. People dying, starvation, it's an absolute shame come back to our initial statement. So, and I, I personally, I see uh, if it can be done, permaculture systems in the center, some uh, EPG greenhouses as plant nurseries and for special plants, and if the young plants are enough stable, they go out in the landscape. Such combinations I can imagine. Discussions with the partners, Australia, their heart is also more near to smaller decentralized system. Therefore, we decided that uh, the technology involved here, we will break it down, make it simpler. Uh, especially what I told you, we are started in Australia, uh, the project to equip uh, the Aborigine villages uh, with self, with autonomous systems. So they will consist of energy greenhouse, and of uh, system in much simpler form, which can be handled by the local people and all the other energy elements we are speaking. And of course, why it is so interesting to sit here, for example, with TH, and then we need to have the, the bio uh, gas systems, and we need other systems. All the skills combined will bring to a community uh, out of the eldest culture of the world, 50,000 years, and now nearly destroyed. We have seen, it is arrogant and cynical how the Australian government wants to treat these people. First of all, they destroy them nearly, then they say, uh, you cannot live any longer in your villages, you drink only and you are <laughs> desperate. So we started a counter initiative with a big leader, uh, Noel Pearson of, uh, of the Aborigines, very strong man, like, like Mandela, I would say. And he said, yes, that's it. And we called it modern tribe technology, huh? which is a blueprint. Uh, and we, yesterday we decided that it will be in the blueprint way. So we are building such a system near Clausen's factory. And it's very important that Klaus is producing, and he is a man who says, yes, very welcome to young Aborigines uh, to teach them how to do it. So it will become a center of demonstration, and then we will adapt it to the needs, and then we will bring it uh, to the villages. And then we want to have this being one lot of the network of autonomous systems in which we just turn the argumentations. If you speak today to politicians, they say tribes. Uh, I hope we are. This is finished. Huh? <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, uh, nearly finished because the real wisdom of mankind sits in different uh, tribes. You can go to Africa. You can go uh, to Australia, wherever you want. And if this multitude is coming in the network, we don't have only uh, the autonomy. We will have a cultural cross examination to build really this new worldwide structures as a counter element project. We have maybe in one of the future years uh, sitting on top of one of Clausen's 
uh, buildings put in such an EPG. Yeah, here you see Noel Pearson. So we were, that's the nice thing about smaller groups like we here. We were sitting for two and a half days, really intense. And I can tell you, he brought his stuff, you see, so it's not only Aboriginal people, many white, very brilliant people. And we really got in depth, we have analyzed the energetic needs of a typical settlement of um, Aborigines. We found a wonderful way how to optimize the system. I will speak during the days of this. He only listened. Most time, then he played wonderful music. He is a guitar player and singer, fantastic. And then, at the last day, we had one blackboard. He structured within one hour a whole initiative plan in absolute precision on the economic side, on the venture side, on the social side. So I was really impressed. That was good. And I believe that we have here in the auditorium, we have people doing this for their country. So the vision started when we had been in Mali mainly. We said, okay, you build a little greenhouse, you extract from the greenhouse the heat so the plants can grow. With this heat, we are cooking, cooking platforms. This heat is used, this looks not like a sun pile, it was a little bit other sterling engine at this time. We are producing with this mainly, that's a charm about a big flywheel. You have mechanical energy. So if you want to, uh, to, to grind something, the classical way, you need electricity, you need an electric motor, you need a gear to run it. So you can directly go with the mechanical works here because it's decentralized, the charm of decentralization. And uh, of course, the generator produces electricity for the school, for the hospital, and so on and so on. So that is where we started, and we, we it's a, still a process, but now we have uh, the sun pulse engines starting to be produced serially. So, namely in India, uh, we will uh, are in the process of organizing this so that assembly kits will be available for the whole world at a reasonable cost. Uh, sometimes next year. We started with a 500 watt engine because 500 watt was the main demand for water pumping. But we are now, uh, next year we should have a 2 kilowatt and 4 kilowatt engines and they are not bigger than the 500 watt because we are bringing uh, pressure air inside. So we have a little bit to change something in the, uh, in the stability and so, uh, what this will be. So coming into this range, we are coming automatically in the field also of individual homes, which is called uh, kraft wärme kopplung uh, the coupling of electricity and heat. One of the big disadvantages of photovoltaics is you produce only electricity. Yeah? And then some crazy people come to see ID uh, to use the electricity to heat water. <laughs> the standpoint of physics, it's, it's a sin, sin number one. So these people going to heaven one day <laughs> will be asked, did you heat with PV water? Go back. <laughs> you know, okay. And uh, so we will be in this sector. And you may have heard uh, that Elon Musk, if someone kno knows the name Elon Musk, Elon Musk Tesla. is a Tesla car guy and the guy for SpaceX station. Huh? He said uh, about half a year ago, so the whole American financial world started to become nervous. He said, I will bring an innovation which will step away is the classical power industry. For us insiders, it was clear what he would propose. He would say, okay, we have, we have cheap photovoltaics, maybe from China, maybe US start producing cheap. And since he is producing car batteries, lithium iron, so he's now building a huge company in Arizona. 
because he wants to combine for the solar home photovoltaic system with the battery, which is in principle makes a lot of sense, and then they are becoming independent from the grid. And uh, going through the economics, I'm not going in detail. A heat-driven system with a heat storage is much more economic. And we are not running, that's the next point I want to point out. If we are looking for the energy future, for rare materials, and lithium is, is not, uh, okay, if you, we have the big lakes in South America, we have in Tibet, salt lakes, and uh, we maybe if we take it for the whole world consumption, some say it will be for 200 years, some for 300 years, but how could we think in a solar age only for 200 years? What comes after it? So we, we are planning for the next 4 billion years. <laughs> of course, that's as, as long as the sun will shine on this planet. And therefore, we, we need, it's a very important point I want to point out, that not only functioning system, enough robust, enough simple, uh, capable to create local jobs, not on a too high level, so can be afforded. The materials must be plentifully available. So for example, bringing in a sterling engine, air instead of helium seems a little step, but from the pragmatic point, it's a world. So all these sterling engines running on helium, high temperature and so on, they cost a hell and they are leaking, such things. And going to lithium, last remark here, we can already see, literally, that the next distribution wars for energy will no longer be for oil, but for lithium. Yeah. We cannot run in such a, a mess. So, therefore, we, we, we gave to our technologies a name. Normally, say, oh, this is low tech. It's nothing. We are high tech. We said we are eco high tech. Because our efficiency is perfect, but the production method is low in the niveau of uh, money needed and the materials abandoned. So we say eco high tech is a better high tech than the high tech you have today. If you have a semiconductor you want to produce, you have to invest one billion dollars at least. Yeah? So you come automatically again to the centralization of energy. And if you want really to become free with solar energy, then you better by going in these principles we discussed. Solar can and should become beautiful. So I don't uh, pretend that everything is beautiful, we show you. It's still in a stage where now artists can come, can integrate it in wonderful building envelopes. That is so important. Huh? So we are no longer specialists. The specialist is the sun. It's producing the photons. And we are multifunctional thinkers using multifunctional methods. So we allow artists to be integrated as well as engineers, as well as others. No glasses. It's the freedom of the future. So I thank you very much.